Flyers through center. It's Michkov, left side. Comes around behind the net. Andre couldn't get it back out in front. Rizzo absorbs a hit. Puck's going to stay in the zone. Bonk is shoved from behind. Rizzo going to sit down right side. Michkov trying to pull it in behind the net. It's in! Everybody, it's Isaiah, and I'm here with Chef B, who's going to tell us about one of our sponsors here. Chef? Yeah, OMB Podcast is now brought to you by Summit Public Adjusters. The winter months can be especially hard on our homes, from roof damage to peeling siding to frozen pipes and toilet overflows. Call Summit Public Adjusters before you call your insurance company. Dealing with your insurance company can be stressful and confusing. Let Summit Public Adjusters take the stress out of the clean process by having our guys work for you. Get the most for your money and your repairs. The next time the big snow or the rain leaves you with some home damage, contact us for a free consultation. Summit Public Adjusters are licensed in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Learn more at summitpublicadjusters.com or call 215-752-0560. Just tell them that the chef sent you. Yeah, what was that number again, chef? 215-752-0560. That's terrific. All right. We're going to carry on with the rest of our show. And we are back. It is Isaiah. Welcome to the OMB Podcast, episode number 233. As the Philadelphia Flyers have closed their rookie camp, the veterans have reported they've actually played a couple exhibition games. And uh, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. Teams also made some preliminary roster cuts as we have players as scuffling off to the uh, CHL and others that are going to the AHL. We'll talk about that. Uh, we're brought to you by FlyersNittyGritty.com, uh, Summit Adjusters, and Jim South Street. Let's talk about Jim's because before we get rolling, because 40 years of the best cheese steaks and hoagies in the grandest Philadelphia tradition, you know you want one. And, you know, if you're down there and at, four, at 400 South Street, Check it out, man. They, they're they're all remodeled after the fire, and everything's great. The, the great dancer who went down there, had one, really enjoyed it. And, of course, there's DoorDash, Uber Eats, you name it. We'll get that delicious food right to your door. So the next time you want the absolute best in Philly cheesesteaks, hoagies, and fries, Jim South Street, 400 South Street in Philadelphia, PA. Let's uh, introduce the panel Back from a couple of week hiatus, it's always to my left, Chef B. How are you, man? What's the word? Very good. Very uh, happy and anxious that hockey started up. It's going to be an exciting season, I believe, and I, I think it's going to be a fun one. So great to have everybody back. Fantastic. And, of course, the great Dan Silver I just mentioned. I had that uh, Jim's uh, steak just not too long ago. Such a great tradition. Come up to Philly, get a cheesesteak, go to a Flyers game. And I'm excited. I was at the Flyers Caps game in DC where I live earlier this week. And uh, that was a fun game to go to. So it was um, ready for hockey season. Oh, yeah. That's right. And we are ready for the Flyers writer for NHL.com. He's a content writer for the Flyers Alumni Association. And of course, for years, he's been writing great stuff at hockeybuzz.com. And we're pleased to welcome Bill Meltzer. Bill, thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Always a pleasure. Uh, unsolicited testimony. I haven't been to gym since before the fire, but that, that's good stuff. So I, I'm looking forward to that. You know. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, they had, they yeah. had, they built out a new extension. Uh, they kind of like bought out the, the space next to them. So you right. go in and normally you'd have to go upstairs to get a, uh, a table to eat at. But now they've got an adjoining room you can go in and get a table there. So it's it's an even better experience at gyms. Excellent. 
Sounds great. I, I can't wait. I got to get back to Philly just for that. I mean, I love to see the relatives and all. It's been a while, but hey, you know, Jim's, you got to have priorities. All right. So, Bill, the Flyers made some cuts today, and uh, there are some names that we do recognize, uh, such as Carson Bjornis and Spencer Gill and uh, Carter Southern, a uh, pretty, a pretty good draft pick. I think he was a, what was it, second or third uh, prior draft year in 23. And, um, and uh, some of their players went to the uh, AHL. So why don't we talk about some of the decisions there, even though there weren't many surprises? Sure. Sure. Um, well, uh, I, you know, I, I feel, I feel a little bit bad for, uh, for Zade wisdom because this is the third and final year uh, of his entry level deal. Um, during the, during the pandemic year, when the, uh, you know, junior season was canceled. He was playing with the Phantoms. And, and mind you, a little bit of a watered-down AHL because of the taxi squad. But still, it looked like he was showing some promise. Um, it's never really come together for him since then. And, and, and this year is really the kind of make-or-break year. Um, whether he starts with the fourth line with the Phantoms, which, which I hope for him, because, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of his opportunity to at least establish himself at that level as a regular or if um, you know, if he ends up going back to Reading again, but uh, you know that's that's just kind of the, the downside of it. A guy starts out well, maybe stagnates, maybe goes a little bit backwards. Um, really, really good guy, really hard worker. So that uh, that that's a guy who I think you're inclined to kind of root for. Um, the the guys, the recent draft picks, the guys picked this year and last year um, beyond Jet Luchenko. Um, you, you figured out Oliver Bonk would still be here, and he is. You figured Luchenko would still be here, and he is. Um, the other guys like Bjarnason, who I thought really ha- has shown improvement from a year ago. You, you really want to really one of the big things about camp for guys who are, are really not slated to make the NHL team is you want to see that year to year progression, a, a comparison how they looked a year ago. And I think Bjarnason has taken a nice step forward over the last year. Um, I would expect that that he'll make Team Canada for the World Juniors. Now, whether he starts or backs up, he'll compete for that. But um, you know, sometimes when you look at a guy on a, a junior team, when a, when a guy's on a particularly good or particular, you know, or just kind of a mediocre team, which which Brandon has been, the Brandon Wheat Kings are one of his the storied franchises in the Western League, but it's been kind of tough in recent years for them. And and Bjarnson's been a little bit of a victim of that, but. Um, he, he's added a lot of muscle. Um, he's playing his angles better, I thought. Um, hopefully with another year of progress, he'll, he'll be ready to debut for the, the Phantoms a year down the road. There, there will be jobs there. So uh, I, I think he, he showed that year-to-year progression. Uh, the other goalie that was in camp, I, I thought Sam Hillebrand showed a, a, a – I guess he showed pretty well, I thought, in the rookie camp. Um, you know, it, it, it's so hard. It, in in today's game, a goalie who's six one, about you know six foot one, by today's standards, is actually an undersized goalie. Um, not that they can make it, but it, it just it, it's harder to make it. I, I really I really think that if he was two inches taller, he would have been drafted by somebody. But um, the it was a little bit you know he was really kind of a, an uphill battle, and he, he unfortunately ended up getting released from his ATO. But you know, but he he's just a, a year removed from when he would have been drafted. So he's a guy who will maybe a year from now will have something to say, maybe back here, maybe with another organization. Um, and I said the, the other guys, you know, like, like Spencer Gill, he brought up uh, second round pick this year, uh, rail thin, rail, you know, uh, really, really good skater, really good physical tools. He needs that a lot of muscle. So I, it's not going to necessarily be a quick process. Carter Southern, um, had the, actually the, the same kind of – if you remember Tommy Soderstrom, he had the same heart condition yeah. that uh, Southern has. Um, it seems oh, to be under Wolf control. Parkinson White or something. Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, yes. Yeah, same, same, same thing that Tommy had. Um, uh, but the good news is that, that, that it's under control now. The uh, It seems medication one not corrects the irregular heartbeat. It's something that's going to have to be monitored, but, it, but his long-term prognosis is good. Um, had a really nice year in the Western League last year. Unfortunately – um, he, he got injured on the last, I think it was in the, I think it was actually in the WHA finals. So um, he didn't play in the Memorial cup, but he had a nice first draft year. 
Um, and really kind of a common thread here. A lot of these picks from last year really had good draft plus one years. Um, didn't even mention uh, Yegor Savragin because he's, he's still playing in Russia. He had a great first year. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you, you look at that crop last year, obviously, you know, Oliver Bonk, nobody expected him to score the way he did a year ago in, in the bumper spot. You know, everybody talks about Michkov, but last year's draft is shaping up like a pretty darn good one. You, you know, as you move forward, so so all that stuff is positive, really. With 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 those guys who weren't expected to make the team and, and get cut early, um, I I think uh, most of them perform would perform the way you'd want to see them play. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's a really good wrap up there. There there also was an addition in goal with the A two uh, McInerney yes. uh, kind of t- taking up a slot that might have been filled by Alexei Kolosov. And it it kind of leads to like comments, a discussion about comments that you made uh, today about the folly of the advice that, you know, Kolosov got in terms of, you know, the opportunity is there for him to get some NHL time as early as this year. Yeah, no, absolutely. When you look at, when you look at how the how the phantoms shape up right now going into the season, uh, had, had McAniemy not been signed, and uh, by the way, folks, you, you can break his name down. If you remember Andrew Niedemaki, take the Maki, take you remember Andre you know, Niemi, Auntie, you know McAniemy. So anyway, anyway, just 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 break it down and make it easy. Um, but anyway, he, uh, I, I remember his couple of games with the San Jose Sharks. Actually, one was on one was on uh, TV, national TV. Um, he, he's only still only 25. He's had a lot of injury issues. Um, it was originally a hurricanes prospect, uh, went to the sharks and he, he seemed to be really trending upward and then he had a couple injuries. And on the other side of the injuries, he had some, uh, consistency issues and last, last year was pretty inconsistent to be truthful, but it's never been a question of talent. He's, he's always had the talent to be a pro. I don't know about an NHL number one, but the talent to be a pro, and you never know where where it goes because goalies tend to take the longest to develop. Um, I thought he's been really good in camp. Um, yeah. Now, and I, now what happened? What happened was Kolesov opened the door for him, and I and I, I really think that given the opportunity that, that was in front of him, you know, it, to me it was, it was it was very foolish to a insist on a guaranteed NHL spot, which. There's not one of the 32 organizations in the NHL that's going to give him a guaranteed NHL spot. They're all going to expect him to earn it. So it's it's not like he's going you know, like to get his rice traded somewhere else and they're just going to pencil him into the NHL. He, he'd have to earn it wherever he goes. A. B, um, you look at the Phantoms roster situation. Before McAniemi, well, they have Cal Peterson, who's only signed through this year. And so Peterson's gone. A year from now, he we I'd be shocked if he's resigned a year from now, you know, next summer. Uh, is it impossible? No, but is it probably isn't likely. They're probably going to go younger in that. So, uh, I you know Cal, well, I thought was pretty good in the playoffs for the Phantoms last year. I thought he was very inconsistent in the regular season, um, and and was below average in his games with the Flyers. So, there's an opportunity for a younger goalie to a take that the primary starting starting position away from him. At the very least, you're going to split a 50-50. And it's almost inevitable you're going to have a goalie injury during the year. Or maybe it's a performance thing. I mean, that, that would not be good for the Flyers. But but let's say, you know, let's say the, the Kolosov falters. And for a little while, you carry three goalies. Well, that's an opportunity there to get some games in, whether through injury, through performance, merit, or whatever whatever circumstance brings it about, there there's an avenue that's there. And to deliberately, A, miss all this time in camp, where because he signed to an entry-level deal, um, he cannot legally go play in the KHL. And there, there are guys that KHL teams in the league and the Russian Federation will fight to keep there. Um, you, you look at you, you look at a year ago at Fedotov, for example, um, and that was that was really a that was really almost like a league pride thing, just because he was the best goalie in the league there, 
Um, there's the whole thing with the Red Army team that, uh, you know, and now, now mind you, he didn't do anything different than dozens of other players in the KHL do, which is duck military service. Okay. He, that, that's commonplace. They arrange it for them. Some guys, some guys, uh, do you remember Mikhail Vorobiev? And he just got a little slap mm-hmm. on the wrist a year ago. He did the same thing. He had, he had a card that said he had done his military service, but he never did a day. He got a fine. No, 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 wasn't sent to Siberia. Wasn't potentially sent to the front lines in Ukraine. Um, you know, uh, but they decided to make an example of Fedotov, and uh, yeah, they really fought to hang on to him. And there was, there was a little arm twisting too. Let, let's be honest to get him to go back to to uh, Red Army. But anyway, he's the guy they're willing to fight for because he was their Olympic goalie, their na- you know their national team goalie, and. Uh, the top goalie in the league the year before the, the whole military thing, playing on a championship team. While Kolosov has been a good young goalie in the KHL, even a number one goalie, he hasn't been a star. He hasn't been a top of the league guy. Plus, his, his team in Minsk, in good faith, made an agreement with the Flyers. I mean, they, they got a really sweetheart deal last year. The Flyers paid the freight for him to play the year in Russia. Burned the first year of his entry level deal, and uh, you know they, they basically got a, a, a nice young player with the Flyers paying the bill, and it burned the first year of his entry level again because he's uh, he was too you know, he was past the point where he they, they could have had the contract slide. So that that was kind of a sweetheart deal. They entered in good faith with the Flyers to send him over when the season was over. Uh, he was in no rush to come over when the season was over. Truthfully, he kind of made up his mind ahead of time. He wasn't going to like it. And he made mm-hmm. sure he did. I mean, guys invited him out to dinner. They try, tried to make him fit in, you know, to, like feel welcomed. He didn't really want it. And, and you know, and he comes back this year, well, if there's an NHL job for him, he'll come. Well, again, that, there, that wasn't going to be the case. So it, it makes you kind of question his maturity, his judgment, and the advice that he's been getting. Um, is, he, is he a good prospect? He still, Yeah, he's a good prospect. Is he Shesterkin? No. Is he Sorokin? No. Is he Sergei Bobrovsky when, when Bob came over playing in the worst team in the KHL, not even being drafted, but he played so far above his head? And he came with no guarantees. When Bob came over, um, he didn't know if he was going to be the Phantom starter, the Phantom's backup, Flyers backup. He didn't care. He came in to compete and to work. And guess what? He ended up as the opening night starter and the Flyers' primary goalie that year because he earned it. And really, that 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 opportunity is right in front of Kolosov. You know, if you're as good as you think you are, come in and earn it. And there's still there still is some window of time where he could do that. You know, uh, and and not burn the year. I mean, right right now, what good is it doing him sitting sitting home in Belarus playing for nobody? Yeah, well. So that's uh, that, that's kind of the situation there. Uh, in, in the meantime. McAdiemi, it, it kind of just by just by the numbers game, you figured he's probably going to get a contract at some point. But he's been really good in the, in the scrimmages. He was he was good in his half a game in Montreal the other night, and they just figured, well, let's do it now. So you know now now he now he has a real opportunity. He he turned that tryout arrangement into a contract. So so good for him, and you know, wish him luck. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I've been hogging the mic here. Chef, will you go, and Dan, we'll get you in uh, with your uh, input there. Go ahead. Well, my question is this. We, we see how much, and if you go across, like, Trisdale got bigger. Everybody got bigger in camp. And also, it seemed like they all hung out this summer together, and they came as a they, – they pulled together as a team. Everybody, Farabee, all, all down the lineup. You see all these young guys. They're a nice young team. Everybody talks about how great a team the Phillies are right now, the way they're they're playing as a team, and they're and it's just there's something different, there's something special about them. Is there a chance for this group now? I mean, we're seeing that that they're hanging together, they're working together, they go out to dinner together. There was a couple of pool parties we saw on Instagram. It seems like this this young core is 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 ready to make a turn, and and kind of solidify themselves as all right. This is what we're doing moving forward. And it, it looks like they brought Mitch Koff right into the fold. Like he's assimilated already. It seems like he's joking with people. Yeah. He's speaking like with Bonk, and he's speaking with other guys too. And and it just seems to be 
seems like everything seems to be fitting together. Yeah, and then, and I also say along the lines of Mitchkov because I actually had the uh, the opportunity to watch a, a little preview of uh, of the standard. There's a, there's part of it where there's the team golf outing. A uh, Mitchkov already understands a fair amount of English. Um, doesn't only speaks a few words, but he's, he's understanding more and more. And, and there's a, a part of the golf outing where because he'd never played golf before in his life, clearly, right? But uh, he wants to learn. I mean, the, the guys are there. Like Couturier showed him actually how to, how to grip the club properly. And, and he's trying his best to copy it and, and, and follow the advice and understanding what's going on. I mean, obviously on the ice, he's a prodigy. But, but that tells you how much he wants to fit in, how much he wants to be part of it, and how much the veterans, not just on the ice, but in the day-to-day environment of the team, are embracing him with open arms to make him feel like part of the group. And that's, uh, I mean, that, that, that's a huge part. That, that, that's a huge part of assimilating a player over here. Um, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of these guys were either drafted together or, you know, you grew up in the organization together. And there's something to be said that, something to be said for that too. He, I mean, you, you can look back at the, all the way back to the Keen's kids era, right? Those yeah, guys grew yeah. up together. Those guys were young players, prospects in the organization. So that, that, that created a bond that, that lasted even beyond their Flyers years. And um, this, this, this is an exceptionally tight-knit group. Um, and you have veterans like Scott Lawton, who makes sure everybody feel like, feels like they're part of it, part of the, you know, part of the uh, process that's here. They, everybody has their role to play. So there was something to be said for that. I mean, the team overachieved a year ago. Um, I think it's critical that the team team got off to a fast start last year. I think I think it's critical to get off to another fast start this year. Um, the good news with that, although I don't think they're going to sneak up on teams this year, I think the good news is that, A, the Flyers a year ago entered the regular season in the best physical condition of any team in the NHL. They had the most grueling and demanding camp, and they they enter the season ahead of other teams in terms of conditioning-wise. That, I think, contributed to the fast start. And then, B, other than other than Mitchkov, and maybe to a smaller extent, because he's only for part of the season had an injury, so maybe dries down to a smaller degree, this group knows each other. They've been together a while. And sometimes when you have a familiarity on the roster, they can gel a little bit faster. So I think the elements are there to a quick start. Obviously, the the trick is following it through. Uh, when the schedule gets gets a little bit tougher, um, you you have more off days early in the season. At least you're getting a Western trip out of the way right off the bat, so there's not a big time zone adjustment or anything like that. But um, I I think the, that combination of things bodes well to to start the season. Gotcha. Dan, let's get you to weigh in here. I know you got a lot on your mind about this team. Well, I want to play devil's advocate on Alexei Kolosov with Bill. The Flyers have all of the power in the situation right now. Unless the Flyers trade Alexei Kolosov, he's not going to be able to play in the NHL. So they already have all of the power here. Um, I guess my question is, if he's desperate to play in the KHL for one more season, why don't the Flyers give in, sort of, you know, swallow their pride a little bit, let him play in the KHL for another season, and maybe by then he'll change his mind and he'll be like, okay, you know what, I'll come over and I'll play in the AHL. I mean, it it just seems like it's sort of only serving to damage the relationship with the player at this point. So I'm just kind of curious, like, you know, why wouldn't they potentially just let him play a year in the KHL and then come over if he wants to? And you know what? If he plays in the KHL and he doesn't, he never comes over. All right, fine. But what have you lost by allowing him to do that? Well, A, I I think I don't agree. I don't think you ever let the inmates run the asylum, first of all. Mm -hmm. Secondly, he already burned a year of his entry level, uh, you know, at his request. A year ago, he didn't. A, a year ago, he asked for another year alone, uh, and understanding that that was going to burn a year of his entry level deal. So 
the Flyers did that in good faith with the understanding that he come over late in the season. And it was not a surprise that he came over just to get his feet wet. The understanding all along, I mean, I heard it mid-season, so, so, you know, I doubt that he didn't know it, that he was coming over just to get a couple games in, kind of be around the team, get the routine down, and then come back to compete for time this year. Um, I mean, he didn't have a great attitude about coming over in the first place. Again, he, I, I think he kind of convinced himself he wasn't going to like it, and it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. He was convinced he wasn't going to like it, so he didn't like it. Um why burn? Why burn another year? Eventually, level. Um, that, that that that's how I say it. If if you could loan him over there and uh, and still toll him, but but with a loan you can't toll him. So you know if he goes and he plays, if a KHL team would sign him or a team in Switzerland or Germany or wherever the case might be, Flyers told the year and he still owes him two years. Um, in terms of damaging the relationship, I mean, I, I think he's the guilt. I think he's the guilty party here. I really do. Um, they, they are willing to work with him on this. And, and again, he's not, uh, you know, while he's a good prospect, again, he's no Shesterkin or, or, or Sorokin or, or, or Bob, you're going to bend over too far for the guy. Um, I, I honestly think Zavragin at, at 18 is the, or I, I guess 19 now is the better prospect of the two. Um, now, you know, if Zavragin a year from now wants to sign entry level or even two years from now, you burn a year the same way you did with Polosov, I, I would do that. But uh, but I'm not burning two. That, that, that's where I stand. So okay. how do you think the situation with him is going to play out? I, I would think that he would, he would be get, he get kind of desperate to play at some point. Um, I, I don't see uh, – the more he digs in his heels here and the more time he misses without playing anywhere – Playing, playing nowhere doesn't benefit him at all. I mean, no, no, it does not protect an asset. Um, the Flyers set a price tag on him, and I honestly don't think they're going to get a second-round pick for him, which is the, the price they set. I think more likely if you move him, it says one one uh, component of a multi-piece trade, and then a team that maybe has interest would say, okay, you add him in to A, a and or B, and maybe that's the way he could go somewhere. But, but – I don't see him going somewhere where they, you know, unless they're just riddled with injuries. I don't see any team saying, here's your NHL shot right off the bat. So he, he's going to have to be willing to work his way up from an American League team, whatever organization it is. Everything yeah, I've I mean, heard, you know. he doesn't even want to come here. He's not coming. And, that, and that's very good sources overseas. He doesn't he doesn't want to come. It's I think it's done. I think his 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 whole flurry to I think he wants to stay in a KHL more familiar to him and everything else is too anticipated it's, because also too they they did try to give him a roommate and he declined that somebody that would true. speak the language with him and to help him out and to make him feel more comfortable and he denied that, 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 that that's yeah, all true know. and 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 I don't know if you guys you guys remember or know of many years ago the Flyers had a not, not a Russian guy but a Finnish guy named Yuka Pekka Seppo Yuka Seppo was a second-round pick, um, very talented player. Uh, you know, he, was, he was kind of a prodigy as a young player in Finland. Flyers really thought this guy was going to come in and be a 30 to 40 goal guy in the NHL as he developed. Now he went to one camp and experienced Mike Keenan. He went home and never, never wanted to come back again. <laughs> so it, it uh, you know, it's uh, it happens sometimes. Um, I, you know, but but Kolosov didn't have, didn't have his version of Mike Keenan. You know, I, I just uh, I, I don't know. I, I just kind of wonder where his head is at. That's all. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, I, you know, I, don't have to, yeah. you know I, I don't think we want to get into the whole Cutter Gauthier, Alexei Kolosov thing. But the Flyers are the only organization in the last year that's had two high profile prospects have similar types of things happen. Now, we can try and defend them if you'd like all we want. But I think it's fairly clear that there's some sort of lack of communication that potentially could be occurring with some of these guys, or they're not doing their due diligence when they draft guys and are drafting guys that you know, potentially have uh, attitude problems. Like you can't really have it both ways. The Flyers are drafting these kids and now we're kind of saying that they're entitled. Okay, well, I mean, you know, then maybe you shouldn't draft entitled kids. 
But yeah, and then that, I just don't want to give them an easy out. And I also would kind of like to see them try and swallow their pride on some of these things to try and not, you know, create an untenable situation to the point where we're like, yep, Kolosov's never going to play in the NHL because, okay, now we're, okay, well, Jaeger Zabragin's probably a better prospect than, than him anyway, which is fine. That might be true, but there's no guarantee he's coming over that's either. As, as we, that, That's we, true. And, and honestly, you know, I, I I think there's there's context on both. I, I do I do agree with you that it is a that it, it is a bad optic. I, I you know I think I don't think you could get around that. It. It's a bad looking optic. Um, you know, but we, we could talk about each guy individually. I, I think with Gautier, he wanted to be in the NHL at the end of his first year. Um, the Flyers' intent was still to to develop him as a center. And I think it's a very fair assessment that he needed another collegiate year at center. Now, if he, now, now it's, it's kind of funny because he's ended up breaking into the NHL as a winger because there's not a there's not a center spot for him in Anaheim. So it turns out he's a he's a left winger anyway. But I I think you know to me I, I think there's a case to be made where maybe you, maybe you do bring him over, put him at wing, and then see a year or two down the line. Can you convert him to a center? In which case, I, I think you would have had him signed at the end of that first year. Uh, in, in terms of due diligence, I mean, you know, I mean, this, this is a guy who who spoke the whole, you know, I was born to be a flyer. It wasn't Those words weren't put in his mouth. That, that was said, he said that at the combine interviews. He said that when he was drafted. He, he told that story, which I actually didn't love the sound of. But remember when he told the story about how he met Tortorella for the first time? And he was yeah, shoving, and he was like, yeah, shoving yeah, 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 and he, and, he, and like a team employee was saying, he like shoved the team employee away, which again, I, I didn't love that story, but whatever. But I, I, I think that there was that avenue, and again, maybe, maybe the, the answer was to sign him right away, start him on wing, and then move him to center eventually. Then I think he'd be here. Um, he didn't, he didn't like being told to wait another year when he thought he was ready, um, and. And when Kolosov, uh, you know, I think I think it was very clearly communicated that the plan was loan him, have him come over at the end of the year, and have him compete this year starting out with the Phantoms. He seemed okay with that plan until it actually came time to come over. So it's I, – I mean, I, I do think you have to look at it and, and why did it happen with, with two different guys for two different reasons. Um, it is something you, you need to be mindful of. Going forward, it's not uncommon for for players from Russia, Belarus, you know, Kazakhstan, I guess to a degree, and, you know, players might come over to believe that, okay, well, I'm a regular in the KHL. I don't want to ride buses in the AHL. I want to be an NHL guy. I mean, there, there's, zero, there's zero chance that Michkov will be sent to the Phantoms. But if the Flyers try to send him down, he has the option of just going back to Russia, which he would do. And you know, but of course that's not going to happen. He'll, he'll be with the NHL team. But I mean, it, it, it's very common. Russian players, not not Swedes, not Czechs, not Finns, to not to believe that playing in the AHL is beneath them. That the the, the the elite league that they play in in Europe is equal to or better than the American league. So they're not in the NHL. They want to play back there. It's it's not just Kolosov. It, it's it's a number of guys. I mean, look at just what happened with the Skarov, right? He said, "Okay, I've had enough A." Now he put in some AHL time, but it was kind of okay. I've had enough AHL time. I'm either in the, you know, I, I want to be traded. I'm going to be in the NHL. So, uh, and, and maybe right, maybe not right. But that's uh, that's that's just the it's just part of the risk factor. Sometimes with, with drafting Russian players, um, some guys will some guys will put in the the uh, yeah, put in the work, and some guys aren't, aren't as willing to. So I, I do think you know I do think you need to do your homework. You do need to look at that. Um, yeah, and, and and with Gautier, and I, I fully expect him to be a very good player in the NHL. I would not want him. I would not have wanted him as a center. And after that first year, he was still not. He was still below average defensively. Center is too important of a position to be just a one way guy. I thought he improved a lot last year. I, I thought the second year of college hockey actually helped him a lot, but he had it, you know, he kind of had it in his mind that, uh, 
you know, that uh, well, I want to, I want to be somewhere else. So um, I, I, I do think sometimes you have to look creatively again. Uh, I mentioned the option of having him break in as a winger after the first year, and then maybe you develop him down the line. And, and I really do think he'd, he'd be here if that had been the case. So I, I do think there's some fair points you've raised. Hmm, interesting. Hey, hey Bill, uh, let's take a look at the, the groups that are left. There were three groups. Now there are two. And then there's one group that looks very obviously NHL ready or real close. And then another group where it's kind of like the outside looking in. And, and there's some surprising names. If you want to look, if you accept that premise, it it looks as if that Jet Lachenko is among those. And there's a lot of discussion about the merits and the downsides of letting him push for a spot, whether that means he just gets nine games or he would actually make the team in a Sean Couturier fashion. Maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I see... Th- I see the argument because he's a very mature young player and already plays a two-way game. And um, I, I think he could play right now in the NHL and not embarrass himself defensively, which happens a lot of times with, uh, with players are in over their head with the defensive roles, especially as a center. Um, I think the flip side of that is A, does Luchenko being on the team this year make enough of an impact, enough of a difference that he pushes the Flyers to where they're potentially a playoff team? That's first of all. Second of all, okay, if there is a spot for him and it'll be as a center, well, uh, they're, they're counting on Frost in the top six this year. Now we'll see. We'll see the, how they assess him after this year because he's a restricted free agent, one year away from being unrestricted. But, but but going into this year, he's in your top six group at least at least to start with. Um, they're not they can't trade your you know, they can't trade Couturier's contract. A, B, he's your captain, and and signed for multiple more years. So they they need Couturier to be healthy and to look kind of how he looked in the first half last year before he had any, another injury, hit the wall, whatever. So Couturier's not being pushed off the team. Um, that leaves Paling and that leaves Lawton or, or Cates if they move Cates to the middle. Right, who sits? Right. I, I don't I don't think A given the players that uh Tortorella likes how they play and um just just their contract status and those other kind of things. I, I just think the numbers game works works against Jed as an eighteen year old. And and third and final thing is that um I think he could come in again and not embarrass himself, but I'd rather he be playing 20 minutes a night every single night in Guelph than seeing him play 11 or 12 minutes uh, under John Tortorella. I, I, um, what so often happens with really young players, and, and he's about as young as it would get in the NHL. He, he only turned 18 um, literally a month ago mm-hmm. uh, on August 24th. He's one of the youngest guys in his draft class. Um, if you saw today's practice, um, first of all, love is competitiveness, but he was, he was getting manhandled by paling and, and by Ristolainen. Ristolainen in particular does not, he was taking, you know, taking some enjoyment and knocking him down to the ice every chance he could. I mean, that's, that, that's one of those rites of passage that a, that a young player has to go through. I love that every time he popped back up again, but, uh, you know, but I, I, I think another off season, that more strength to his frame, that couldn't hurt him. He, he only just turned 19 a year from now. I, I kind of remember back to uh, uh, Travis Konechny's first camp because um, he was a, drafted in the first round, came in. I think the Flyers had a uh, – not a rookie's game, but they had – their first exhibition game, I think, was in Allentown, BPL Center, and he scored in that game. And I think he scored in his next game too. And then there's all this talk about starting him in the NHL. And the Flyers made absolutely 100% the right decision to just pump the brakes on that, send, send them back to, uh, I think it was the Ottawa 67s at the time, although he was traded later in the season. But they pumped, they made the decision to just give him one more year of junior hockey. And I think that that was the right decision. I think it would be the right decision for Luchenko also, because 
I think he could, I think he already come up and be a, a competent playmaker. And I think he's going to be a very good playmaker and two way center. I, I think sooner than later, um, you take scoring twenty goals, and I know Guelph was a weak team, but he scored twenty goals is mostly their first line guy. Though, well, 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 Frost scored twenty his you know, his draft year. Yeah, but but he was the Greyhounds' third line center, not their first line center. It was the next year when they moved him up to the top of the lineup. They had 109 points and, and 40 something goals, and I think Luchenko could do similar or, or even more. So let, let him go and play 20 minutes a night. Let him continue to work on his shot. Let him play in all situations. Let, let him not have a situation where they've burned his first year, and uh, and like so many young players who hits a wall around November or December. And uh, okay, well, you know, he has he has one point in his last ten games. Is he now playing ten minutes a night? Is he scratched sometimes? It happens so often with really talented young players. I, I I don't think they have to take that avenue. Is is the nine game tryout an option potentially? Um, if you can if you can work out the roster numbers to to get him onto your roster, um, you also have the option of uh, if he goes a while without playing. Uh, he would be eligible for like a two-week conditioning assignment with the Phantoms, so that's nine NHL games plus the plus the two weeks with the Phantoms if he sits a while. But then you have a guy who a lot of times when a guy comes up into the NHL and, and plays that the nine games or whatever, and then he ends up finding himself all back back in junior hockey. I think there's a letdown effect with yeah. a lot of these, and and he's a mature kid. But still, I think there's almost there's almost there's almost always a letdown effect with a lot of these guys where it's like, well, what do I have to prove? What do I have to prove at this level? I just I just think that you be patient, give it a year, see how much he develops over the next year, and it would not shock me one bit if he doesn't need a second, you know, a draft plus two a year. I I think he'd play. I, I think he's pretty close to a lock for the World Juniors for Team Canada. In fact, I think he could play fairly high up in their lineup. All, all that's the, all that's there for them this, this year. So again, just just uh keep the big picture in mind. That's all. Gotcha. Yeah, Dan, you actually saw the first exhibition game in Washington and we had the thrill of uh, Matt Bay Mitchkoff's goal or you know he had two assists and that just everybody had a it was a fun time just the exact opposite would happened the, the following night but uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience and what you liked when you saw the team in washington no it, it was awesome it was um i slapped on my new joel Faraby jersey which i bought last year and then of course there were all the trade rumors this summer so i'm i'm glad he's still on the team we'll see how long that lasts i still think he's Got a lot of upside as a pretty good NHL player. So got the Ferry jersey on, went to the game. And uh, I actually, I moved, you know, there were, maybe the arena was like half full. So every period I kind of moved to where the Flyers offensive zone was because I really wanted to kind of focus on, you know, their, you know, the, the offensive guys, Lachenko, Mitchkov, uh, Frost, seeing all those guys. So it was a, re- I mean, it was a great experience. And, you know, I thought, I thought that, uh, for me, the most impressive flyers were Fairby and Brink. I thought those two guys were great. I mean, we haven't talked a lot about Bobby Brink, no. but you know, last year he was coming into the season off of that <coughs> surgery, you know, sort of still recovering a little bit from the surgery. Um, and he still was was decent last year. Obviously, he had some some missteps, but now he had a full summer to train. And I mean, he just looked explosive. He looked great in that game. Some really nice goals. That line with him, Lachenko, and Farabee was fantastic. I didn't think that, um, I didn't think, like, so obviously whenever you watch Matt Bamichkov, like his skill is going to pop. I didn't think that he was that great, like away from the puck and sort of, you know, through the neutral zone in that game. But uh, John Tortorella in his press conference today said that, you know, he seemed like he was maybe a little bit tired in that game. They were they were double shifting him a decent amount, but the skill obviously pops. I mean, the the first Morgan Frost goal where Mishkov kind of had a like a almost a no look behind the back pass to Frost behind the net who brought in front was a great play. The uh, I get a really good angle of a video of the power play goal uh, that Frost scored. I was sitting in that zone and put it up on Twitter. It's a pretty good video of the puck movement there and the movement there between Drysdale and Farabee and Mitchkov 
And then Mitch Cobb just threads that pass back to Faraby. Faraby gets it, sort of shuffles the puck towards net, and Morgan Frost scores on the rebound. I mean, it was just fun to kind of see that type of skill pop. Um, Jamie Drysdale, you know, he does look healthy. He looks great. His skating looks fantastic. He's the guy that can make a huge difference, especially on the power play. And, um, you know, one guy that they cut today that you guys mentioned that I was, you know, been impressed with sort of how smooth he looks out there is Spencer Gill. I thought that he he's a kid who's got a lot of kind of like scope and potential to him. Yeah. But it was just, it was it was fantastic to uh, just to be there and and see hockey again, see these guys performing. You know, there's just so much excitement about Mitchkov. Um, can't wait to go to the home opener. And uh, it, you know, it was just it was great being there. There were some Flyers chants going on in the game. There's always some Flyers fans in DC. So it was uh, it, it, it you know it was great. And it is fun to have. It's always energizing to have young kids. We all knew that Mitchkov was kind of kind of be like this, but Lachenko is sort of and and bill just went into detail so i won't go into detail on him but he's been more you know he's been fantastic and i think a lot of the fans are sort of forgetting about the whole zev Buyam thing at this point um because it's clear that luchenko has a pretty good nhl future he does have to work on some things but it's energizing having a guy like him a guy like mitch cobb that you can kind of look at talk about as sort of part of the future of this franchise so so it's it was great it was a great game to go to love seeing you know some of these guys pop I think if the Flyers can have a third line that really can add scoring depth, like if you if Faraby and Brink are both guys that sort of are gonna have pretty good years and you can find a center for them, um, I, I think even you know Noah Cates with between those two guys could be a potential pretty nice line if Bobby Brink and Faraby can drive the play a little bit. So those two guys are important for this team. If you could have three lines that can score instead of just two. That could be a big deal. So, so those are some good signs that I saw. Hmm. Good, um, Bill. I also wanted to talk about you know you you mentioned the uh, the Keenan bunch, the Keenan kids, and I was just kind of thinking a very similar thing. This is kind of what the Flyers are trying to do, especially because I mean, yeah, they had Tim Curran and Mark Howe. So, I mean, well, there's you know there's there's a talent gap if you're comparing the two. Certainly, as things sit right now. But that is the kind of approach the Flyers appear to be going for uh, as things stand. And Oliver Bonk is part of that. He hasn't been a standout. I see him not make some nice, calm plays. But, you know, he's expected to go back. But, but what have you seen from him in, away from the cameras in the games that we've seen? I, I think he's been fine. Um you know, I, I thought he was I thought he was pretty decent in uh, the one rookies game that he played. Um, I, I think it's been a mixed bag so far in the scrimmages and in the uh, the one game that he played. I thought he kind of struggled in Montreal, but so did a lot of guys. Uh, Ronnie oh, had yeah. Ronnie had really struggled. For example, you know, I, I, I thought that Hunter McDonald had some ups and downs, but uh, you know, I I thought Bonk was okay. In Montreal, but again, it's uh, he graded all of it on a curve, so he'll he'll get some more games here. Um, I don't think he's I don't think he's made a case where he's going to break the door down and say I'm ready for the NHL right now. But but we know what he is going to do is that uh, he's a lock for Team Canada. He played World Juniors a year ago. Um, you know, L London Knights are still a, a very good. Uh, very good team, a contender to win another championship in the, the OHL. Um, unfortunately, we haven't been able to see Denver Barkey in camp because of there's a mono. But, right. but uh, you know, I'm really curious when he turns pro if he will play a bumper role. Because that, that's really kind of – I think he'll be a, a solid enough defenseman to be a, be a top four guy. But to me, when you add the potential power play element onto it, that to me where he's pretty intriguing. Um, so I, you know, I think the prognosis is the same. I guess the only thing is that uh, I don't know the expectation was that he, that he was going to make the team this year, but I don't, I don't think he's breaking the door down to where that, that's even going to be a serious discussion. I think mean, he'll get another couple games, and then then he'll head back to he'll head back to London. But uh, you know, still, still very, uh, very good prospect. Um, you know, Dan mentioned. Um, 
Zen, Zev Boom, Zev Bowie. I mean, you're not really hearing much about it anymore, but, you know, because Luchenko's looks so good. Um, you know, I uh, and I, I really like Bowie a lot. I like the prospect a lot, but um, they were looking, I think, at some other kinds of defensemen. They already had their kind of offensive-minded guy. Um, you know, he's the he has the same agent that uh, that Ryan Johansson has, same agent that uh, the Cutter Gauthier has, same agent that uh, yeah, if you go back a number of years that um, uh, Matt Carl had when when Matt Carl had agreed to an extension with the Flyers, and then the next day they signed he signed in, in Tampa Bay. So the Flyers have a little bit of history with his agent. I don't think that's the only reason why they why they didn't draft him, but I do think that was a little bit in the back of their minds, right? Um, but I, I think the I think the, the Flyers, you know, uh, the, the guy that I questioned at the time was why not draft Hellenius? But I think we've seen enough in camp where oh, what Luchenko looks looks really really good. Um, so you know, I, I think long term that you're still going to need that stud number one track defenseman. Um, We'll see how much how much further Cam York can take it this year. Um, I don't think it'll be a true number one, but he was top two last year. He's improved by leaps and bounds, and I expect him to continue to get a little bit better this year. Hopefully, Drysdale stays healthy. So you, you might have a pretty decent blue line this year, but I, I I don't think you know I don't think their blue line either prospect wise and certainly not the NHL level is the tip tip top of the league. I mean, sometimes you have to make the decisions as to whether you, you go forward or defense. Yeah. Yeah. I can definitely see that. Uh, chef, uh, any thoughts about, you know, what you've seen so far and what you're anticipating the rest of the uh, preseason? No, you know what? No, I haven't. I, I'm waiting to find <laughs> the only th- the, the other game uh, aside. The only thing we're rougher about Adder's game, the other in the Montreal was the fact that it, it so much damn French in between the, <laughs> yeah, the talk. And I'm like, oh, it, it was a little hard to follow on the feed, but, you know, so it, it was hard to keep interested. But I'm looking forward to the other preseason games now because I want to I want to be able to see it in a more professional setting and actually sit there and, you know, obviously, uh, what's it, tomorrow night, Islanders tomorrow night at home. And so you'll, you'll get something, you'll get a better product to actually view it for all of us that can't go down. We have that's all we have, and when you're watching on your computer or, or you know pulling it up on you know, or your your phone just to watch a game, it makes it a little bit difficult. But I I think I think there's still another step some of these guys can take, and uh, I just wondering you know uh, Camp Torturella, let's see what uh what it brings out of everybody. I was trying to get that to trend the other way, hashtag tor- Torturella, but we'll say I, I I just think that. He, you know, as much as people hate it, I think it builds a lot of character. I think they, they, as much as the players hate it too, I think they actually like it because they know that they're getting the best out of them. So I, I'm looking forward to see what they can, you know, now that they've cut everything down and you're going to see more of the, the players that have a more reasonable shot to shine. I think they'll shine even more. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it was interesting aside. I, I caught that Canadians game. I can only get the RDS, which, is the French feed for those not familiar with it. Yeah. And if I hit the wrong button, I was immediately uh, forwarded yeah. to a porn site. And <laughs> you know, by the third period, you know, it was getting tempting. No, I'm okay. But uh, yeah, yeah. No, you're meeting the okay. five hole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Well, okay. Moving right along here. But, but I think that one of the Islanders, it might be this one coming up, is an ESPN game. I'm not sure if this is it, Bill. Is it this one coming up or is it another one? Let me just do they play the Islanders? I have the schedule here. Oh, yeah, no, it's this Thursday. It was listed on ESPN Plus. So mm-hmm. if you have ESPN Plus, uh, we might finally get some real announcers instead of what we've had so far. So, not that Jason we... did a bad job the other day, he, he was no, all right. No, no. I just want to say, no, no, no. <laughs> Just it's yeah. The other night it made an impression on us, uh, but it, it was really a nice gesture and one that driven apparently by John Twitterella uh, with a Guy uh, Goudreau, the father of Matthew and John, invited to the Flyers practice, and it's an invitation that came maybe a you know a little while ago, not you know shortly after the passing of those two, or the unfortunate passing, and he finally did 
um, show up at the Flyers practice. And uh, Bill, I, I don't know if you were there or um, yeah, it's still it's something that you, you had reported on. And uh, I think it shows another side of uh, John Tortorella. Yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, Tortorella is just, Tortorella I think is a little bit of a complex guy, okay? Um, you know, you, you hear some very good things, which are true, and you hear some not so good things, which are also true. That, that's just being honest, right? But but I, I think I think that, uh, A, in the situation with the Goudreau phone, I mean, everybody feels awful about it. If you're, if you're human, you feel awful about it. B, they're, they're royalty in our area. And, um, and C, that the coach to coach respect at different levels. I mean, that's something, that's something where John Torrell has always practiced what he preaches. And, um, you know, he's, he's always been very supportive of other coaches and, you know, helping give guys opportunities uh, one thing that I think is an unfair criticism of John. That's uh, you know, kind of kind of an aside. I know some people who don't like him. Say, well, I, I guess he thinks he's above coaching preseason games because he every year he every year he delegates the first three games to his assistants. I don't think it's that at all. I mean, part of it part of it is assessing his players, but also part of it is giving other coaches a look, uh, uh, you know, some experience behind the bench, maybe opportunities down the line. I I, I think that as the oldest coach in the NHL. Um, you know, so when you look around the league, there's only one coach who was born before 1960, one active coach, and that's John, right? Um, and, and I think I think he kind of takes being the elder statesman the NHL coaches seriously. And um, but just just as a just as a, a, a human gesture of doing the right thing by somebody, I'm not I'm not surprised that he did this. I I, th- I think it was uh a pretty easy thing to do to, you know, to, to again, just to, to have compassion for the family and just, just express it on, on a coach to coach basis, bring him around the rink where it's the, the territory that he knows is familiar. You know, it's, it, it listen every day for the rest of the Goudreau family's lives. It's going to be hard, but let, let, let's just be honest. They're, they're, they will miss, they'll miss Johnny. They'll, they'll miss Matt. Um, you know, they're, their wives are, are going to have to raise babies. Uh, you know, it's just, I, I can't, I can't even imagine it. Cannot even imagine it. But, but a little thing like this that to, you know, to just kind of not take your mind off of things, but just, just to express support and put you in a comfortable environment. I, I, I think that's, that's just the, a simple right thing to do by somebody. So absolute kudos to him. Kudos to the Flyers. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I just had two more for you, Bill. Um, just I didn't want to let you get out of town here without giving us your overall assessment, having watched Mitchkoff through the rookie camp and a couple games and how he handled the fit, you know, uh, all, all that's been put upon him. Uh, in terms of handling it, I think he's handling it great. Um, you know, every time, every game he's played, he has moments. Um, you know, would I like to see him pop a couple goals in the preseason? Sure. But is there's a, there's a critical? No. Um, uh, he's earned his points, you know, other than other than one scrimmage where he had all kinds of chances, just nothing nothing went in for that line in that game. Um, you know, I thought, uh, like, I thought Owen Tippett played into some tough luck. He had a bunch of chances. Um, where Michkov created a couple, Frost created a couple, Tippett created a couple for himself. You know, the the, the chances are all there. If, if you're not going to finish them, now's the time not to finish them, right? But um, but I, I, I just just in terms of Michkov's ice vision, his anticipation, um, his line mates, whoever his line mates will be, uh, because in in practice today, uh, he was with um, with Couturier yeah, and uh, Forster, with, yeah. And Forster, rather, you know, where they, where they had uh, Tippett, uh, you know, and, and Frost with Konechny, which is a really good combination too. I'm looking forward to seeing them. I uh, the the indication today was that okay, they they've seen some of the stuff that the Tippett and Frost can do with Mitchkov. Okay, let's get a look at him and some other guys. See see what he can do with with Forster digging pucks out for him. See what he can do in, in getting the pucks to the net. But what I was going to say was one thing that I've absolutely noticed. Uh, with Michkov, 
saw in the saw in the KHL and streams too, but you know, but they tend to focus on whoever wherever the puck is rather than the whole zone. Mishkov's really, really good at getting himself to the net. Um, if you if you're looking for him and get him the puck, you can have a lot of slam dunks near near the right post. Um, particularly particularly if uh, Frost continues to be willing to shoot the puck, because I, I think Morgan is very pass first a lot of times. Sometimes sometimes a little too much. And um, you know, I mean, you know, we know what Tippett can do in terms of taking the puck to the net himself. So. I, I expect uh, some settling in period, and I think it'll be fine. In terms of off the puck, that that's going to take time. It's not what he does best. I think there's a willingness, willingness to learn, um, that that stands out about him. And I, I you know, I I think it's going to really help the power play. Um, uh, one thing that, that Dan was talking about was uh, um, was the power, the second power play goal, the, the Frost second goal in that game. I loved Farabee's goal in that game. Tic tac toe, you know, mm-hmm. Tippett, Frost, Farabee in the bumper, which was was a, was a weak spot this year, and back of the net. If they can do that even a little bit this year, that that's a that's a huge improvement because they they got nothing. They got nothing in the bumper last year. That's something that's something that I'm looking towards. And the play that Michkov made that uh, that that Dan referred to in the second Frost goal, he made that he you know he made that sequence happen. So, so to have guys that, that can make things happen, um, that seem to have a little bit of a radar passing wise for each other, that's uh, that that's something to build off of. And really, you're not looking for wins and losses; you're looking for building blocks. And you know, I, I think those building blocks are there. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, if with that power play, if Drysdale and Mishkov can, like, if Drysdale can take it sort of to the next level, that power play, those two guys could revolutionize it. Yeah. Um, with Drysdale skating and Mitch Cobb, and, and what I really liked about that power play goal that Frost scored was just the, the roving nature of where the guys were. Like if, you know, Mitch Cobb can be behind the net, he can be, um, you know, on the half wall, he could be back at the point. Drysdale can also keep moving around. You know, you find the right combination of guys on that power play. And I still think that like a guy like um, Tyson Forrester can, you know, depending on what happens with his one timer, like he could be a guy who on his on, on, you know, in that left face off dot can just sort of fire away. They can set him up. Like they, they're going to have a lot of weapons on that power play. Um, And, you know, I know, you know, Bill and I have been fans of Morgan Frost for a while. Like maybe there's another level he can get to also with the has surrounded by, by some of these guys, including Mitch Cobb. So um, (laughs) I, I, I will guarantee this, the, Flyers power play is not going to be worst in the league for a fourth consecutive year. They're just, there's, you know, with Mitch Kov, with hopefully a healthy Drysdale, it's it's not going to be that insanely bad this year. So I'm, I'm, ex- I'm, I'm excited just for that. You know, every time there's a, a power play, I think it's going to be fun to watch, right? I mean, this, this, this might not be a playoff team, but there's going to be some exciting things to watch. So that's fun. Right. Yeah. And, and- People, that just leads me to my last one, and that's like before the Flyers open the regular season in Vancouver on October 11th, between now and then, is there anything that you're looking for from a player, from the team, just in general, any or anything specific? I'll say that I still have an ongoing question mark about the consistency of the goaltending. I, I think coming out of last year, you, you had to have that question mark. Uh, it's going to be a while till we know those answers. I really want to have. I really want to have a comfort level. Um, I don't. I, I don't think McAdoo is going to step right into the NHL. You know, I'd be work his way maybe get, get a couple games. We know what Cal Peterson is. So, so right now, your guys are Urson and they're Fedotov, and um, you have such a you have such a small sample size from Fedotov. I I toss that out, but I, I don't know what he is. Right, and and Erson has stretches where he's really good. He looks like a legitimate number one, and then then there are other times where it's just a little too up and down. Too many games where he was pulled a year ago, for example. You know, mm-hmm. um, I really I, I most a, a lot of guys who go like the couple guys, uh, Sanheim, New York. Um, see who else hasn't played yet? Uh, Connecting Connecting should be in in the lineup against the Islanders, but I'm really looking forward to Erson. And um, 
You know, I, I want to see Earth take it and run with it with some consistency. And uh, listen, your goaltending, you're going to sometimes you're going to rise and sometimes it can pull you down. And team defense is always a big part of it. Uh, I think the blue line is going to be serviceable. But I, I think if you're if the goaltending is is inconsistent or subpar, then everything we've talked about for the season, you know, you're 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 way down. You're you're way down. So I, I want to see those guys take a step in consistency, and I, I really want to see them make a little bit of a statement heading into the season. So that that that, that, that to me is a, a big focus going in is where your goalie's at. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Bill, what are you working on right now? Where can people find your work and what uh, other maybe book projects or what have you are, is, is coming up? Okay, well, uh, let's just uh, we'll run through real, 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 real quick. Dave Schultz is working on his autobiography. Um, I'm, not, I'm not the main co-author. I'm just assisting with the, with the Flyers portion of his career. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that, that's fun working with Schultz. So that book will probably be out in the fall in time for next season. So that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, and, and, uh, right, right now the working title is lessons from the penalty box. So, uh, yeah, so that, that, that's, that's been a fun thing to work on uh, a guy by the name of Dan Robson. Uh, I don't know if you ever read Clinton Larchuk's book, but, but Dan wrote that he's a very talented writer. Okay. So that's, uh, that, that's been a lot of fun to work on. Um, and also of course, as the, the Flyers alumni content manager, there's not going to be a, a Flyers hall of fame induction this year because, just because the schedule didn't work out. Uh, I think there will be next year. But uh, next spring, the alumni have three big events, like three events in three days. There's an alumni pickleball tournament that's in Malvern. Um, and you could be a novice. You know, it's really adjusted to whatever your level of experience and interest is. Um, so that, that should be a lot of fun. I went to the, to the, the, the test run event that they did this summer. Um, the second day is a, uh, is a, is a 5K walk run and also a, a, a long distance bike ride. So whichever, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever interest level you might have. I mean, and then the third day, they always do the golf tournament. The, the third day is the golf tournament. So right. you know, all the stuff supports all the stuff the alumni do for charity in the community. And, and they, they should all be fun. So we've been, we've been preparing materials to kind of get people, you know, psyched about this event. We'll, we'll, we'll be launching some of that stuff, you know, really, really soon. So a lot, lot of good stuff going on. And you can read my stuff every, basically every single day on the flyer site. I'm doing practice reports. Uh, tomorrow I'll have the, the game preview, the game wrap up. There's a, there's a uh, little recap of, of the new um, standard episodes, episode one, which we'll be doing throughout the series there. And this year we're, we're going to bring back some player features too. Um, you know, really kind of after the pandemic for a while, there just wasn't as much opportunity to, to do player features. So I'm, I'm excited to go back to, to to talk about individual players a little bit too. Oh, that's terrific. Well, Bill, I want to thank you for coming on and uh, I hope to see you down the road real soon during the, you know, during the season. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's always a pleasure talking with you. Yeah. One of my real quick, one of my fun, yeah. one of my funnest things when I go to the Flyers, James is Bill and I usually will meet up during an intermission, even uh, introduced my mom to him last year. She's a big fan. So I always love, I always look forward to seeing Bill at some of the games this year. So it's, and he's always great to have on the show. Thanks. Yeah. I look forward to seeing you at the home opener. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Fantastic. Bill, thanks again. Absolutely. Anytime. Thanks. Right, take care now. All right. So uh, gents are a lot of really good information from Bill as usual. He uh, very mm -hmm. comprehensive. And now's a good opportunity for you guys to sound off about anything that we haven't covered so far before we call it a wrap. No, I think, I think we pretty much covered everything. Well, almost everything. Let's not, you know, say that we're, we're that great, but <laughs> I, I just think uh, it, it should be a fun, no matter what happens, it's going to be a fun and entertaining season to have the talent for it. So I, I again, I will say like what you said last year, uh, enjoy the ride. It's going to be, vastly entertaining at least as you know as as long as this team can team can stay relatively healthy mm -hmm. all right you can yeah. uh, argue with me about that too anyway at on chef to let be on on uh on x if we're doing that now so uh yeah before before i i, I get to that just i i did think we played the islanders again 
And so I gave out information about the ESPN Plus game that could be Tuesday the 30th at the island, or on the island, as they say, instead of this uh, game coming up tomorrow night. So I, I just want to make sure I put, put that out there. The Flyers are at home against the Islanders on Thursday, which is, of course, the 26th. We're recording the 25th. And then on Saturday, they play the Bruins at the Wells Fargo Center on the 28th. And then they have the Islanders on the 30th on the island. Then they're at Boston, and they close out the exhibition season on the 3rd with the Devils. And then, of course, they go out to the West Coast to start the uh, the regular season when stuff starts counting, the games start counting. Dan, yep. uh, do you have a final word? I'll let you have it. Yeah, you know, I didn't get to talk about Luchenko. I mean, he, he really is impressive how mature he is how strong he is, how fit he is. I, I think that he's really, I mean, in addition to Mitch Cobb, he's really kind of energized fans a little bit. And mm-hmm. probably, you know, we, we needed it because we do need, you know, I'm not ready to call him elite talent. Um, and he's got a lot of stuff to work on. What I wanted to say was, you know, there's a lot of kind of momentum building to try and from excited fans trying to keep him around. And Bill talked about it a decent amount. I just really think the best thing for his development is to go back to the OHL for at least another year. A lot of people are saying, oh, well, the Guelph Storm aren't a very good team. And well, what what's likely to happen is they may trade him midseason for a haul to another team. He'll also, you know, probably get to play in the World Junior Championships. Um, and he he needs to work on some things like he needs to work on his shot, um, which I think that those are the kind of things that he probably will be that he'll have more time to work on and he'll have more space in actual games to work on like his shot. So, you know, I think it's fun that they're, they're giving him, you know, that he's not back to the OHL yet, but um, I would try and temper enthusiasm for this year a little bit. I think it's probably the best decision to send him back. No, I agree. I agree. I, I think he has more freedom to make mistakes at that level can be more adventurous, adventurous, more creative. And that's what you want to bring out of the player. So I, especially in a rebuilding year, why, why, why blow it with this contract? So yeah, it doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, I understand that people's excitement. We're tired of watching Drek for near, you know, most of the last decade. I certainly understand that. So um, one other thing before we get into the, the rap section here, the Ryan Johansson deal has been terminated and it's really up to the timeline of uh, Johansson's agent as to when they're going to challenge it. And I don't know if there's necessarily going to be a resolution that is going to come in time for the beginning of the year, but the Flyers do have the opportunity to use that cap space uh, if they don't want to put Ryan Ellis on LTIR, but just monitor that situation. Nothing's written in stone with that. So, uh, and of course, you can follow the great Dan Silver at DSilver88. So you got to make sure you get that right. And of course, the OMB Puck cast, you can follow us on X at OMB Puck at OMB Puck. Also, our backup plan on Getter at OMB Podcast, at OMB Podcast. And of course, we are on multiple podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, iHeart, TuneIn, Amazon, Audible, Deezer. Of course, we have a YouTube page, just plug in there, OMB Podcast, Facebook page as well. And if you rate and subscribe to the podcast and particularly give us a rating on Apple, Spotify too. But if you give us a a write-up, a five-star write-up, we will read that on our next show and we see that because all these things help move us up the charts when people are looking for a Philadelphia Flyer podcast. And we really do appreciate that. So episode number 233 of OMB podcast is in the can, I guess. Thanks for listening tonight. And until next time, everybody, take care. 